Hello and thank you for watching this lecture. My name is Dr. Shaunak Shastri. I am an Associate Professor in the Department of Communication at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, my talk today is called The Great Unmasking, Critical Health Communication and Post-COVID Futures. Before I start, I would like to thank Dr. Mohan Gatta for the opportunity. Uh, I'm very excited to share uh, some of my experiences in the talk and um, as someone who's been affiliated with CARE since its inception, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be able to finally speak virtually as it may be uh, to the audiences that are that follow CARE and people interested in this sort of work. So thank you Mohan, thank you for the opportunity and to the lovely staff um, at CARE. Um, so to, to give you an overview of my talk today, I uh, have always been interested in um, pandemics uh, analytically and uh, professionally as part of my research program. But with COVID, this analytical interest also sort of translated for me as it did for so many of us into a personal sort of interest or immersion in it, right? And so uh, what I'm going to do uh, in this uh, lecture is talk a little bit about that the personal element as well. So I'm going to interview the personal and the analytical uh, interests in COVID response. Uh, following that, I'm going to give you a brief overview um, of what I mean by critical health communication, um, a brief overview of some key concepts, ideas that guide my thinking uh, over the years in this area. And then I'm going to speak in more detail about uh, prevention politics, the main meat of my talk today, uh, politics of prevention in China's uh, early COVID-19 response. And so that's going to be really the bulk of my um, talk. Uh, my, my work specifically focuses on the questions of masks and mask politics. Um, and uh, I will spend some time discussing some of my findings from my um, extended time doing work in China. Uh, and then as I wrap up, I'll talk a little bit about this novel coronavirus and its relationship to older, earlier epidemics and how, uh, as critical health communication scholars, we ought to think both about novelty and what we already know and really think about the dynamic interplay of the old and the new. And then to conclude, I am going to offer some basic provocations about what masking and prevention politics will look when and if uh, we think about uh, a post-COVID future and the legacies of this period in the future. So that's a sort of a broad overview of my talk today. Okay, so let's begin. Um, as I said uh, in the previous slide, um, one of the things that is interesting to me professionally about COVID-19 uh, is besides my professional research interest in it, right? Um, much of my work has um, looked at the uh, relationship between epidemics and social processes and thinking about how epidemics create this sort of foment or change through which cultures and communicative processes emerge. So in today's talk, I want to share some broad work in progress ideas about one specific feature of the global response to COVID-19, which is the politics of disease prevention. I see this talk as building a bridge between my existing work, as I said, um, and this new radically strange new norm that we face. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm attempting to do is build a bridge between my earlier work on HIV AIDS in the global south most, but most uh, um, recently in India with the context of um, long distance drug drivers and um, also some of the work I've done on uh, communication in the context of the 2014 Ebola epidemic. So while SARS COVID-2, this virus is new, the ways in, the, in which we conceptualize, discuss, challenge and even panic over prevention is in, in a way not really new at all. Right, so to put it differently, my interest is in breaking apart the ideological, social, political, and cultural implications of this radically new moment that we find ourselves in. And in particular, my interest is in the politics of masking, 
um, mask wearing and mask as policy, which has emerged as a key sort of cornerstone of global COVID prevention. Um, as a critical health communication scholar, and we'll get to what that means in a short minute, uh, I'm interested in infectious disease politics in, in an analytical sense, uh, but it is impossible, as I said before, to ignore the deeply personal pathways in which we uh, encounter uh, COVID-19 um, as it has changed so much about our contemporary um, social moment, about how we live, how we work, and so on. Uh, but for me, this, there is, a, uh, I think, a sort of a heightened way in which I have kind of experienced that, and I speak uh, about COVID prevention and the politics of COVID prevention through that lens. Um, as an Indian scholar who divides most of his time between the United States of America, where I live and work, um, and China, where my family, uh, my spouse's family lives, um, I have, a, have some sort of vantage point, uh, uh, at least a unique perspective to offer in thinking about what uh, and uh, the, what transformation COVID has had, right? And the fact that uh, uh, personally, I have traveled and lived in the US, in India, and in China through the period of this epidemic since January 2020 um, offers me if uh, uh, some sort of vantage point, statistical, <laughs> um, uh, I'm a statistical minority who's done that, if not sort of theoretical, right? So for the rest of this uh, talk, I will try to interweave my personal analytical analysis um, with excerpts from um, my experience uh, living in China through the lockdowns uh, and observing and doing ethnographic field work um, through this period. Um, so here to, to start us off, here's one quick um, uh, tidbit, an auto, autobiographical tidbit, if you may. Um, on January 2nd, 2020, uh, the, the US White House received its first intelligence briefing about a potential pneumonic condition that was that had adopted in central China. Uh, word spread that there were at that point nearly 150 cases across the country. Um, there was the origin of this was was um, uncertain. There was a lot that was unknown, but the potential for uh, disruption was clearly present. Um, as it so happens, in sort of uh, irony or hindsight, you may call it, uh, on January second, the same day, I, I happened to leave the U.S. Uh, to head to China, to head to Beijing for a fellowship at a university in Beijing as part of my sabbatical. Uh, long story short, three months down the line, canceled fellowships, um, plans dramatically changed, and I spent three months uh, in a living room in my in-law's house in Nanjing and just sort of was observing these dramatic changes kind of take place uh, not just in China, but also in Italy, in India, in US, sort of just thinking about these chains of transmission. Um, and, and that personal kind of narrative and that personal experience of it uh, has informed how I have started thinking about the politics of COVID prevention, right? So if you see on the slide up there, that's uh, 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 one example of this, how COVID has sort of colonized our personal spaces, right? That's my five-year-old's uh, rendition of how the, the coronavirus attacks our blood cells. So um, to do critical health communication um, and, and to, to study it in, in this moment also means, uh, for me at least, this interweaving of the academic, political, and the personal, and the ways in which we navigate that. So, um, as far as I am concerned, and the way I think of this area of, of research called critical health communication, to be a critical health com, health com scholar means to me uh, to be invested in the critique of um, public communication around health, um, which is another way of saying that so much of what we do, how we act, what we believe, and, and what we resist in the name of health has these deep, uncertain, murky roots in who we are as people. You know, the forces that shape us to become who we are, the stories that we tell about ourselves uh, and to each other. To be a critical health com 
scholar to be interested in critical health communication, the critique of how we come to make those assumptions or have those beliefs or resist certain kind of ideas. Um, critical health communication is, is interested in uncovering the ideological or cultural or social roots of these sort of deep standing assumptions or beliefs that we have about ourselves, about our bodies, about um, uh, uh, about about society, right? Um, and so the title of my talk today, right, The Great Unmasking, um, speaks to this, right? So on, on the one hand, COVID-19 has made masks an everyday commodity, right? We all uh, engage in producing them, buying them, trying to score them on, on Amazon, what have you. Uh, but like so many infectious diseases that came before it, even though masks are new, COVID-19 has unmasked something crucially important about ourselves, about society, some fundamental unquestioned or perhaps ignored assumptions um, about what it means to live in a globalized, highly interdependent, networked uh, form of late capitalist modernity. Um, uh, where we take our ecological fragility for granted, where we sort of continue uh, continuously uh, participate in this um, kind of closed loop of of infinite growth on a on a on a finite planet, right? So there is some something that COVID says about us, and I don't mean this in a poetic sense. I mean that in in an analytical sense. Right. So to do critical health communication is to be interested in uncovering this, the social, ideological, political basis of health. Um, why is it that um, people uh, uh, act in certain ways? Uh, what are the ideological motivations? How does our talk about health, how does, how does available public communication about health make apparent the whys of certain assumptions, certain unquestioned assumptions about our health, right? So why is it that call, that calling something a China virus or a Wuhan virus? Um, why is it why is it that those sort of uh, uh, appellations or labels take root? You know, why are they politicized, right? So an, an interesting thing that um, we, I observed while, while, while living in China was that in the midst of all this sort of pol politicking about the China virus, right? The Trump administration's uh, insistence on calling this a China virus. In China, this was often referred to as the Wuhan virus, right? So there's always this sort of othering. There's sort of this level where you place responsibility or place blame or place um, the control over this, this, this glorious uncertainty um, somewhere else, right? So, um, that's kind of what I think fundamentally uh, critical health communication is interested in to make apparent the whys. Why does do something happen? And just as a disclaimer before I proceed, um, to do critical health communication also uh, implies thinking about communication as constitution and contestation uh, rather than transmission. And I know that's that's it's that's that's a lot of sort of jargony words to put together, but what that what that basically means is that my goal here is not prescriptive. There is excellent work being done in terms of thinking about what messages work, right? Like what, how can we design communication to make people wear masks or accept scientific reality or accept the, the existing medical evidence. And there is, there is work, there is communication scholarship that is interested in testing messages, in message design, in campaign design, in evaluation. Critical health communication is primarily interested in critique, in thinking about why at a sociological, uh, at a global level, right? So we think about communication not as transmission, as the crafting and interpreting of messages, but the fundamental process of meaning making. How do people make meanings around health and what discourses, what, go what institutional, governmental, social, cultural, corporate influences shape those meanings? Who decides how we come to consensus around health? So um, that's just sort of a broad disclaimer about what critical health communication is. Um, 
over over the last 10 years or so my in my in my academic trajectory i have thought a lot about critical health uh, and the ideological roots of health in the context of pandemics right so um if you uh, look at my previous work i have sort of talked about hiv and the and how to think about um, it, hiv epidemics in the global south in the context of critical theory and some of some of, some of the ideas behind uh, in critical theory so what i want to do now is is go through just a very rough laundry list of some fundamental ideas or fundamental theoretical hooks and these are not linear or continuous in any sense but they offer a way to think about what um critical theory might look like in a pandemic right so um uh, when we think about critical health communication uh, and its role in 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 understanding pandemics we kind of you begin with the idea or with with the with the acknowledgement that pandemics are are periods of of what i call semiotic excess right that during a pandemic there is great societal churn there is great um foment and 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 dynamism about uh, very fundamental meaning making processes how we understand um ideas about um i mean in the case of hiv about intimacy about fidelity about abstinence about trust and similarly uh in covid about insider outsider who do we trust what surfaces are 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 clear are safe what what are not so there is a lot of sort of um uh, uncertain uh and foment in in uh that kind of describes this period and to under and and much of what we what we take for granted that we assume that we 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 don't even give a second thought about changes dramatically in a pandemic right is something as quotidian and banal as uh, air travel right become suddenly uh, 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 difficult and challenging and the, the the very nature of how we make meaning in our society changes uh and it is in the spirit of this uh, meaning making Uh, process that Paula Trichler, this influential scholar, talked about uh, the dual epidemics of HIV AIDS, and she was writing in the context of HIV. Uh, she talked about the the biomedical epidemic, right? The fact that disease transmits from one body to the other through droplets, through bodily fluids, through the air, through the water, through water. So there is one level of 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 epidemic that is biomedical, that is biological, but there is the other. and for trichler and many others in her week um the more challenging pandemic or the the, the more challenging um um aspect of epidemics was the epidemic of signification of meaning making as to how do ideas circulate right the the who for the first time uh, earlier this year uh, indexed the uh, covid-19 as a as an infodemic uh, with the idea that there was a lot of um unverified or fake um information about the epidemic that was circulating um on the online uh, um um social uh, social media sites and sort of just the, we were we were um, surrounded by by bad information but this has kind of always been the case and the the argument that i'm um, increasingly want to make is that yes covid is inf- infodemic in the in the sense that with unrestrained access to social media the volume of bad information dwarfs credible information but epidemics have always been this right that rumor gossip fake news have always been the the currency uh, of communication during an epidemic so how the the epidemic of meaning making is as dangerous or or compounds the danger of the biomedical epidemic um and to add to this and i think historically there is uh, another dimension of um uh, of 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 thinking about pa- uh, pandemics critically is the baggage of what is called tropical medicine or the history of relationships between the west the colonial west and bodies in the global south right um it is it, it is not an exaggeration to say that the history of population surveillance and public health and epidemiology uh, coincided very squarely with that of colonial governments right public health emerged in some way what we today call modern public health emerged as a site of control of native bodies 
right with the with with the with the anxiety of colonial administrate uh, administrations about unruly uncertain sick bodies in the glo global south so that is that is this history of the quote unquote white man's burden as it as it shows on the slide right now has always kind of been this this background to understanding and critiquing uh, um, how me how meanings circulate in pandemics um, today though the situation is 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 different right we you know, while the ghosts of colonial medicine and tropical medicine still haunt uh, much policy making in 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 uh, emerging disease management um what, an, an additional challenge today is the threat of the global versus the importance of the local right so this global local dialectic in in public health management is uh, continues to be a, a a fundamental fault, uh, fault line, excuse me, in in thinking about uh, epidemic management. Uh, so, for ex for example, in a, for a, for a disease like Ebola, it is the global threat of contagion to the West, uh, in in the U.S. and in Europe, that was more pressing than the local um, uh, casualties or the local impact of the disease. And so, managing that. Um, dialectic is really, really a, a, a challenge as to how much of this is a local threat, how much of this is global, right? Uh, similarly, uh, scholars like Sheldon Unger um, and Niranjan Karnik have written about uh, what happens when we all live a plane ride away from 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 contagion, right? This idea that that disease categories will be globalized, super spreaders can can now go from Wuhan to, to Shanghai to Beijing and then to Auckland or to, to, to Washington DC potentially. And so that kind of challenges, epidemics challenge the uh, existing ideas around globalization. And with that, with those challenging also emerges the, the notion of moral panic. Uh, and moral panic as, and as, as, as Sheldon Unger has, has written about, moral panic is the idea that there is um, a degree of affective or, or emotional uh, uh, paranoia about uh, disease that uh, that transcends the the biological fear of contagion, and we've seen that with with, with COVID, that has clearly been the case. Right? Um, and finally, I think one uh, last concept we're going to tie all these together, and this is more recent. Uh, Priscilla Wald has this fantastic book called um, uh, uh, has has a fantastic book called Contagious. Um, where she talks about this notion of the outbreak narrative, uh, as that 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 infectious disease outbreaks have a particular kind of uh, story attached to them, and they tell a, a certain kind of self-bounded story: who the hero is, who the villain is, who are the actors, who are change agents, what is the crisis, and what is the resolution. So that narrative kind of plays, and you, we can see that in the context um, of COVID, certainly about. Uh, assigning blame or assigning responsibility. So it, to think about critical health communication in during a pandemic and so to, to, to theorize during this time, uh, this is kind of the reservoir of, of conceptual language that I'm sort of looking at broadly. So as I said before, in this talk, my, my uh, objective is to combine personal reflection and a review of relevant literature to analyze the politicization of personal protection um, in China's early response to the COVID epidemic. Uh, and I, I want to be, be clear what I mean by, by politicization here. And then I'm gonna spend the first uh, few minutes in the next few slides talking about what I mean by this politics, right? This is not just the, the a refusal to wear a mask, but I think of politics more, more fundamentally. Um, and so, uh, to think about prevention politics, uh, and and as I was debating about how to how best to talk about it, my mind rushed back to um, this widely circulated GIF that I saw on the Chinese social media. So my goal is to offer a critical analysis of COVID nineteen prevention and to locate these prevention politics within a global historical cultural context, right? So back in February, as the first reports of a total lockdown in Italy emerged, right? There was, at this point, China was already under lockdown. Large parts of the country were under lockdown. Wuhan, the city was sealed. 
uh, sealed off. Uh, all residents were locked inside, and the, and there was there were there was news in the media that the entire region of Lombardy in Italy would be sealed off because of the um, reports of um, uh, COVID uh, positive cases among um, among the population. And so as the reports of the total lockdown in, in Italy um, so were leaked to the media, there was this interesting um, uh, meme or GIF that was circulating on, on Chinese social media that kind of spoke to the, 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 the idea of prevention politics. Right? It said something to the, and this is my translation, that says, with quarantine, no human rights, no quarantine, no human left. And so uh, it, it, it kind of spoke to this idea at that time, this debate between what um, uh, uh, the stakes were or, or, or how, you know, on the one hand, how recent this, uh, this, was just, this was seven months ago, but it seems like a lifetime ago when we were debating whether having, asking people to, to, to be locked down, to be quarantined was against the fundamental liberal democratic welfare state, right, uh, versus sort of this Wuhan model of like hunkering down, sealing the city. Um, and so prevention politics really is interested, uh, or, or the way I think about it is to think about how, how does the logic of infectious disease prevention rest on a bedrock of pre-existing uh, uh, um, bifurcations or, or categories about between the West and the East, between human rights and no human rights, right? Um, there is this sense in which um, uh, we have moved so quickly and, and so much has changed in the last six months. I mean, just in New Zealand uh, from, from last week when the new rounds of lockdowns were announced in uh, when the, the new cluster of patients were, uh, were identified. Uh, it goes to show how much of that terrain has moved since then, right? So that's kind of what I mean by uh, uh, by prevention politics, right? Um, um, for those of you who remember back in 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 China in in February and January when these debates were going on in the Western world in many countries in European countries of whether lockdowns were even feasible or legal or ethical or permissible. Um, at the same time, in the city of Wuhan, there was this complete sealing off and this lockdown. And this and and mass censorship of the personal accounts of patients, citizens, health providers uh, from Wuhan, right? And so, just to refresh memory, the 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 threat uh, and the the impending threat of COVID nineteen only made it out into the public, uh, at least in 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 the, in the initial context. Uh, due to the whistleblowing uh, work of Li Wan Liang, the uh, the physician whose picture you see on the slide, who was the who sort of went uh, uh, against the sort of status quo and um, uh, started making personal microblogs about um, just how deadly um, and the, and and the, and the fact that there was human to human transmission of COVID nineteen. Um, at that point, when in in considering uh, uh, Western media, uh, Western media's coverage of of Li Wen Liang and of uh, how so-called authoritarian public health uh, uh, approaches were sort of policing bodies. There was this dichotomy between that approach and this and an open Western transparent approach to public health. And you've seen that this dichotomy has sort of eroded since that, right? So there, there is no longer, or at least what COVID has done is has that line has sort of been been eroded dramatically where we don't see lockdowns as being antithetical, or at least we've, we've, uh, we've been asked to create an exception uh, where there is uh, uh, the, the, the greater social good, even in Western democratic liberal states, is operated through the 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 the, the action of the lockdown, right? And this this and, and this is uh, very clear in the context of India. And and um, uh, what we've seen in India is this disruption of of what so-called welfare state uh, public health response look, look, looks like. 
so in india the the uh, draconian lockdown that 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 lasted for uh, at the highest level for about three and a half four months and still continues in 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 areas really shows how uh, the 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 impact of this epidemic on the most marginalized and the most um, uh, vulnerable section of society, right? Migrant workers, domestic workers, who were in some ways brutalized by um, uh, by the state, by actors of the state, right? Um, and finally, uh, I think what is interesting uh, in the in the background of thinking about uh, lockdowns um, and oppositions to, to kind of lockdowns uh, is just to, to reflect about how much of the opposition to enforce social distancing uh, initially was philosophical, right? Was was in the in the realm of 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 uh, whether this is this is ethical or philosophically um, congruent with liberalism, and and to today where the that that division is is just economic, right? Can the economy survive it? And so when we think about lockdown politics and we think about critical public health, this. Uh, how quickly that the terrain shifts is is interesting uh, to think about. So moving on now to kind of the the core argument that I want to make in the context of uh, my talk today is this idea of mask politics, right? Uh, if you were to follow U.S. media and in in the U.S. where being the global epicenter of the disease. So much of mass politics today uh, surrounds the idea of non-use, right? The idea of, of, of people who don't use masks, and and you know, there's this the uh, editorials in the New York Times that call that that call this moment a culture war. There is there is um, a politicization of masks as non-use, rather than focus on that singular aberration in the U.S. My talk today really wants to kind of flip that around and think about the politics of mask use. So on the screen today, now you see a video play that, dis that defines or describes ideal mask use in China. This video was circulated among the business communities and in the general public in about in late January, and talked about how uh, businesses were supposed to reopen in in the wake of uh, uh, the epidemic in Wuhan. Here were the protocols: you come into work with one mask, you discard it, you sanitize, you wear a new mask, you go in, you have your temperature checked. Right. The point that I'm trying to make with this short clip is not that. Not it's, it's not that refusal to use masks is a political act. Well, yes, it is in the most banal sense of the term. But what is more interesting is that mask use itself is a, is highly political, or it creates certain kind of political uh, configurations, and that is really of of interest uh, uh, to me, sort of uh, personally, right? And so, um, if you think about mask wearing, and, and here's how. I want to kind of move on, move from from this 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 moment. I want to kind of create a, a, a dichotomy or a difference between mask wearing as behavior and masking policy, right? So I remember when I was in China when I we, when I saw that video and that video was circulated in in uh, on so many social media networks, uh, and there was this kind of aspirational. Here is the gold standard: you wear one mask, you change it, you dispose it. At that time, masks were severely um, uh, short in terms of uh, access. So there was no public access to masks in China at that time. So there's this weird contradiction between what the state mandates you to do and what one can actually do, right? So um, I remember being in China trying desperately to get masks from friends in the US, from my, my family in India, I had uh, bought a small stack from uh, before I had left India um, like a month ago, and those were fast running out, and we had no access to masks, and so no access to grocery stores, and no access to to the public. So there is this. So uh, in in long story short, mask wearing creates a political reality as much as the lack of 
uh, or the choice, quote unquote, of not wearing masks enough. And so I want to kind of tease that out uh, a bit further. So I, I, if you think about mask wearing as an individual behavior that mitigates social risk, right? You, you, it, it's, it's, an, it's a call upon an individual uh, who acts in her best interest to mitigate personal and social risk. But when you think of mask wearing, you also, as I, as I made clear in my example, you need to think about masks as commodities, right? So they, these are not immediately available. These have to be produced, procured, made, um, distributed, uh, supplied. And these issues, issues of, of mask um, distribution, about, about, of, 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 of production, are, were, were of crucial importance in the early part of the epidemic. Um, and they continue to be in the US uh, and in, in, in other parts of, of the globe, right? Whether you buy a surgical mask or an N95 mask or whether you make your own, uh, masks are not just uh, ideations, they're also commodities that, that circulate in a particular kind of economy of production, consumption, and, and waste. Uh, more importantly, I think mask wearing is also related to a certain kind of symbolic dimension, right? That they are fundamentally linked to identity as we see in the US where there are um, issues about, or, or there are social sort of concerns about whether you should be seen wearing a mask. They are linked to who you are. They, are, they, they produce a certain kind of cultural ritual. Um, they are linked to disease stigma. And they are of course uh, a, a very fundamental way of medicalizing the disease, right? Like you, you see a person wearing a mask and you are immediately thinking about um, disease and disease prevention. So in, in that sense, the masks are highly symbolic. They, they, are, they bring to attention uh, in their presence. Then they are not just uh, biomedical commodities, but they're also particular symbols. Um, and finally, they are the mask, mask wearing also in, involves a practice, right? It, it is linked to compliance. It is linked to rules. Uh, about where one should wear a mask, one where one does not wear a mask. It is linked to um, what kind of mask one wears. And I remember that in, in this, in, as the epidemic progressed in China, there was this sort of great online debate about what kind of masks is, is one should wear. Do you wear the mask with the valve that protects you but doesn't protect others? Do you wear N95? Do you save it for medical professionals as um the case has been in um, in the US, in India, where there's this sentiment about saving these scarce resources for people who need it the most, right? So mask wearing as a behavior sort of involves all of these kind of dimensions. Uh, it's a behavior, it's, it's a commodity, it's a symbol, it's also a practice. I, I distinguish this from masking policy, and I think that the difference is, is worth attending to. Mask policy are uh, ma masking policy is, is, is a political action, right? It requires a certain kind of political consensus, a political will to mitigate the social risk. But more importantly, and I think this is the kind of idea that I'm working working through in, in, in my current work, it is also at, at its core a transaction, right? Mask, um, a mask mandate is also a trans in some way a transfer of risk management to the individual actor from the state or from the institution. It says, that the last point of prevention is the individual. So that it, it masking also as policy kind of outlines this relationship between the state and the, and the individual. Um, it requires, as we've seen uh, uh, around the world, this imagined social contract, right? That we are quote unquote all hashtag in this together, that it requires an, 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 imagine, an imagination of working towards a, a global, or a common good, which we've seen sort of this ideal kind of breaks down at interesting moments. And that why it breaks down and and in and, and what are the situations where, where it, it inheres, where people actually do feel or communities actually act in ways that protect themselves and, and their and their and their peers and their neighbors, that that difference is worth kind of teasing out. Um, as practice, when you think about mask policy as practice, it also is um, hinges on, or it creates the, these conditional access to social resources, right? So, for example, um, access to governmental buildings, access to social uh, services, access to food uh, pantries, all 
sort of channeled through the idea of mass compliance, that you have to be a compliant subject in order to access these sort of um, conditions that are exacerbated by the epidemic. And finally, and I, I think this is the, 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 the interesting aspect of, of mask and mask policy, it also creates identity forms, right? As, as, uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a collective. So in China, there is this refrain, right? Now that 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 may go and to their codes are like they don't Americans don't mask, quote unquote. This sort of really stereotypical or or basic idea that that now gains currency in 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 that context. And and, and I think what is interesting uh, about masking policy as as when you think about it in terms of identity is it allows for a certain kind of compliance, as I talk about in the next couple of slides. So what I'm gonna do now, having distinguished these two dimensions, mask wearing and policy, is talk about the a spectrum of mask politics, right? And so these are ideas that I haven't crystallized in any um, finalized form yet. But what I wanna do is kind of sh show, uh, show you a spectrum of, uh, political uh, possibilities or, or, or imaginations in terms of what happens when masking is taken up as a practice or as a policy and what is the what are the implications of this at individual collective and political levels right so it's really a spectrum from coercion to consent and so this is what i uh, want to present next and again these are not uh, in any way finalized these are sort of dynamic and um uh, not, uh, not in any ways uh, um, uh, binding or or fixed in time. So, what if you see uh, the on the slide? I offer a range of uh, different uh, political imaginaries that emerge as a co as a consequence of mask wearing, right? So, and these are not chronological, but I, I there, there is some degree of sort of evolution through them. So when initially, when uh, when the city of Wuhan was sealed and there was this nationwide lockdown in China, now this is like Chinese New Year weekend, right? So early January in 2020, um, there was this mandatory nationwide mask wearing, which was enforced access to all sort of public services, access to the, the hospitals, access to um, transportation, access to grocery stores all required a pretty rigorous um, uh, screening process, which included temperature checks and masking. So in public spaces, initially, uh, this masking was mandatory. And yet, as I said, as I said earlier, there's this contradiction where there were no masks to be bought. You couldn't find one there uh, online or in person. The only masks that were available at that Point, at least in the city that that I I, I I we were living in, were rationed by the government. So there were these long queues for masks uh, with a daily quota, and from there, from so, so from that coercive, you have to mask and you have to wear a mask, not a face covering, quote unquote. From there, as as production sort of uh, even as production was lagging uh, the demand. There, there, be, there, was, there was an emergence towards, or there was a movement towards compliance, right? That there is this universal compliance with masking in, in 15 days or two weeks after uh, this this policy uh, was was unrolled. And in in some sense, yes, it makes sense, right? There's this historical baggage of SARS and uh, the miscommunication of the government in in that in that context. And so, mask wearing was pretty near universal. Um, and as production caught up in the next few months you saw that compliance is almost like 100%, right? So even when masks are not available in January, when we were desperately attempting to sort of procure masks from outside, by April, China was exporting masks as some, some sort of diplomacy, right? So compliance. And what is interesting here, I think one of the uh, broad macro uh, implications of mass politics was this notion of the private and the public, um, uh, the intersection between the state and private corporations. So massive state subsidies were offered for, for private entities that would produce masks. And almost every um, uh, mask producer in China, in China at that point was, was uh, 
not originally in that business. Right? So there was this massive pivoting in private industry into PPE production, and that was kind of subsidized by the state, right? So here, private capital became this tool of enacting state policy. Um, but at, at, even as this was, as this happened, there's also a creation of what I call a ritual community, right? So there was these ritual communities around mask wearing. Um, for example, there was like really uh, very widely circulated posts and, and videos and pictures of frontline workers showing masks, mask scars, right? Like the uh, what happens when you wear masks for a 24 hour period. And so this heroism and, and the analogy to, to being at the forefront of the war. So there was really this, this creation of this imagined community um, through the frontline workers, right? Um, uh, that that became a pretty strong rhetoric for why uh, you would comply for for uh, with mask use mandates, right? Um, another aspect of 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 mass politics that I thought was was interesting is how, as masks become uh, social currency. Right, so as this policy is, is enforced and people are sort of really hustling to, to get access to masks, you see there's um, that mask, uh, uh, the, the the actual commodity uh, gains a certain kind of social currency. Right? So people exchange it as New Year gifts. There are jokes about you know paying someone in masks. They are linked very clearly to businesses opening, as I as I showed earlier. And so they, they, they achieve in the marketplace a certain kind of um, discursive, but also material currency, right? They become valuable in that sense. Um, but as the virus or as the epidemic progressed and uh, there was a sense that it was brought under control, quote unquote, um, masks also become a certain kind of courtesy, right? So I remember, uh, I, I call it in, in, my, in, the, in the slide, protective versus fatic use of masks. So there is this sense of where mask protects you, but there's also a sort of curtsy where you see someone come into the elevator and you kind of hurry and put a, put a mask on, or you're, you know, you, 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 you're trying to get an Uber and you wear a mask until you see the car, the car pull up. You, you know, this sort of um, a, a kind of um, creation of this public and private dimension that that exists based on this this imagined collective, right? This, this courtesy, and so there in that case, the mask is not strictly protective, right? Because it's not you're not you don't wear it all the time, uh, but it's it it's it, it has a certain kind of imagined fetic kind of views. Like I I I'm respecting you enough to do it, or, or you know I I I I acknowledge that I am a compliant citizen as much as you are. Uh, one of the strongest drivers of this mass politics, I think, as it as the epidemic soared in the US was this proxy of for citizenship, where masks really become uh, a way in which to assert sort of this muscular nationalism. And I think that's the real interesting, gritty aspect of mask politics in China that we've really not thought yet about, about how it became not just a way to uh, protect at the individual level and to kind of, you know, forget the embarrassment of SARS and of the early response, but it also became a very strong muscular uh, symbol for Chinese nationalism that was sort of not uh, all that America was not, right? So there is this kind of um, uh, really easily, easily available heuristic uh, through which you can kind of uh, create this identity of, of this muscular China, right? So um, it becomes the proxy for health citizenship and for muscular nationalism, as I said. Um, it is, it, it, you know, I, I, reading West media depictions of mass use in China, one is often tempted to believe or, or that people actually assume that this is there's this level of compliance that comes from coercion, right? That, that these are just people who are compliant to the state who are not programmed against so-called tyrannical governments as um, we see in the U.S., but I think there is a there is a there is a level of deconstruction. There is a level of um, uh, breaking this uh, sort of going below the surface to think about the history of SARS um, and and the, the initial sort of lack of transparent crisis communication uh, and what that does to individuals. Right, so mask use for from an individual Chinese citizen 
the perspective of a, of a, of a lay person is not just compliance, but it's also individual protection against uh, a non-trusting uh, a, a non source, right? So, so it becomes uh, in some ways a, a, a way to, to uh, safeguard against, uh, uh, to, to bring control back to the individual, right? Um, and then finally, and, and I think through these kind of circles, you see today this sort of generalized social agreement or this consensus about the value or the utility of masks um, that is informed, as I said, by the history of, of SARS, the SARS epidemic, uh, but also the, the comparative caseloads of China versus the West. Right? So there is this um, sense in which there's now today you see this societal consensus and Rather than assume that this is all, this was this was this preceded the mask uh, mandates. I think the 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 interesting thing about mask is precisely how this consensus was achieved uh, in many ways through coercion, in many ways through sort of hegemonic understanding of muscular nationalism, so on and so forth. Right. So on the uh, on the one hand, you see a lot of these new discourses of masking being. Um, sort of this, you know, a response to this radical newness of COVID. But I think also as a scholar who has studied HIV, right, I'm, I'm, the more I, I read about mass discourses, the more I am drawn to the idea that the, the, the coronavirus is novel, but the, and has created a new register for prevention, right? It has created these new terms, these new vocabularies, but the politics of epidemic prevention seem to follow really well-worn practices, right? This That hasn't changed. So masks are only used in specific public situations, right? Um, but if you compare them, for example, to the history of condom use, for example, in, in and how the consensus around um, what is called CCU or consistent, correct and consistent use of condoms emerged as the gold standard for HIV prevention. You see the similarities, uh, there, there's a real overlap, right? In terms of moral panic, in terms of this, the idea of religious exemption, the threats to children, uh, how to talk about mass and education, uh, to sort of how they colonize the normal every day, right? So, the parallels are hard to miss if you have are historically minded, right? Now, granted, masks are used in public situations. Uh, condom use is sort of the private domain, but they both sort of uh, both masks in the context of COVID and condom use in the context of HIV challenge this public-private uh, dimensions that we see, where you mask in public, don't mask in private. Uh, you wear condoms in, in private, but only with certain kind of um, outsiders. So there is this sort of inside-outside dynamic that is worth kind of uh, deconstructing and, and, and requires more attention. Um, over, overall, though, I think the, the, the sort of broad takeaway from, for this, from a critical perspective is that so much of masking discourse is new, but we've we've seen this before. We've seen it, right? The critical scholars must kind of ought to recognize that we've this moment has uh, we've seen this in the decades long activism around around uh, around HIV, around safe sex, around testing. Um, so in in that sense, to to be to to have a critical response to COVID nineteen also means to be historically minded about it. Um, so to wrap up, then I. Um, Want to just give offer a few brief comments about what 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 masks or what masking will look like as the epidemic kind of progresses and we see you know models that say that our next two or three years will be sort of an on and off on and off kind of pattern. Um, in the context of China, as the number of COVID cases recede, the the typical blue surgical mask is no longer quotidian in everyday life. Right, you know. So it's, 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 you don't see it all the time. Just yesterday, um, the striking image of thousands of maskless Wuhan residents at a pool party um, in a, in, at a pool in Wuhan sort of were, were published around the globe when there was this kind of dread and fear about no masks. Um, in, in the US and India, of course, the situation is very, is very different. The virus continues to, to escalate with tens of thousands of new cases every day. Um, 
I think what is interesting to think about is that is one is the the the, the the question of production and distribution, right? The production, distribution, and circulation of these perishable, paper-thin, but not insignificant commodities, they are, offer a peek into the alternative possibilities to current configurations of market-led globalization, right? Whether this alternative was the turn to artisanal production, cloth masks, the re-emergence of like tailoring and doing it itself, or uh, in the case of sort of multilateral um, multilateralism that that kind of uh, went against the grain of this of you know competitive advantage that was at the heart of neoliberal um, uh, globalization um, uh, where we think of the global economy and not as as discrete elements so as we um, uh, as we think about what uh, masks will or what masking will look like uh, and and the, the 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 implications or how masks how mass politics will inhere even after COVID. Um, I'd like to end with thinking about or offering this idea that um, uh, if we compare um, how say condom stigma or prep stigma in the context of HIV has sort of dwindled and. Has, has created these subjectivities that are sort of activist uh, activist subjectivities around um, around prevention that we might see similar futures for these uh, commodities that are at once uh, very banal, very everyday, but are imbued with symbolical and political meaning. That's kind of all I have. I want to thank you for your for your time and for listening. Uh, and if you have questions, please uh, feel free to email me. Um, at my institution email address and I would love to answer um, and chat more. Thank you.